Now, we all ultimately know how history has played out for Mark Calloway, the man we better more affectionately known as the wrestling character, The Undertaker. He's spent almost three decades, the past 30 years, as part of the WWF and eventually WWE family. And in that time, he went on to become one of the real pillars and bedrocks of that company. He became one of the cornerstones for the things that that company did as it transitioned away from the Hogan era to the new generation era, next generation era, to the Attitude Era, to the Ruthless Aggression Era. I could go on and on and on. Like He's run the entire spectrum all the way from the Hogan Era to post-Cena Era in WWE. It is truly something remarkable when you really think about it. To be able to stay on top and be viable and thrive for as long as The Undertaker has, even though you're going to say, well, in recent years he's been part-time and he mostly would just work Mania. I understand that, but still, to even be in that spot, to have even made it that long, with all the injuries and all the time that's went by, like, and as we think about wrestling, how hard it can be to stay relevant, and you know all that he's done to be able to get there, like, it's, it's something truly remarkable when you think about it. When I think about the Undertaker, one thing I always think about is what would have happened. What if the Undertaker never left WCW in 1990? What if he didn't come to the WWF at that time, or maybe never came to the WWF at all? What would have happened with his career? Where would he have gone? What would he have done? Would we even think about or know of or even remember him to this day if he hadn't have went at that moment in time? I think it's one of those interesting kind of hypothetical things to really think about because the reality is it's hard to know, it's impossible to know, but it's sure fun to kind of speculate and take a look back at. Because when you think about Mark Calloway in 1990, like this is a guy that was working as Mean Mark Callis in WCW, and this was a guy that, you know, between his time in Memphis and his time even at the very beginning of World Class to his time in WCW, this is a guy that you can see these different companies looking at him and saying, this is a big dude. So... You want to at least give him every shot that you can to get him over in wrestling because a guy of that size and that profile and that kind of presence, if you can figure out a shtick and a gimmick that works and a way for him to connect with the audience, you could certainly potentially make money with him more easily than you could with some smaller guys. That's just reality, especially back in that time in professional wrestling. But in 1990, admittedly, he was just kind of spinning his wheels and, you know, just, I won't say low man on the totem pole in WCW, I don't think it was that, but... Certainly was never going to become a big star there. He was just a guy. He was just another guy. He was a jag. He was not anybody, even when you go back and look at him now, all these years later, he was not a guy that you would have picked out of the crowd in 1990 and say, that guy's got potential. That guy could be something. That guy is interesting. You really didn't see any of that. He was a guy that was just kind of floundering along before he came to WWF and the stars aligned, the gimmick was perfect, the situation was perfect. And he became The Undertaker. But let's say he would have stayed in WCW in 1990. He didn't go to WWF. Well, you, you know of the reports of Ole Anderson telling Undertaker when he looked at him, he said, I can't see why anybody would ever pay money to see him. It gives you a pretty good indication that WCW was not high on the guy. It's part of the reason why they allowed him to leave and go to Vince. They didn't want him. They didn't think he was worth it. So it's hard to envision a situation if he had stayed in WCW for the next couple of years that all of a sudden they would have figured it out. All of a sudden they would have put the right package together for him. All of a sudden Mark himself, frankly, would have truly, truly figured it out and become any type of worthwhile star in the company. It's more likely than not he probably would have continued to toil around in different tag teams or been some type of notable giant jobber. Like somebody that you bring out that looks kind of imposing and impressive, but then every chance you turn around, you're going to beat him. I wouldn't have been surprised even if he had stayed with WCW, especially got into the Jim Hurd era. Like They would have done some really dumbass gimmick. He probably would have been one of the ding-dongs, honestly. Like God only knows what stupid crap would have been in store. The Master Blaster or anything else. Like, you know, maybe he would have been slated to be Vinny Vegas. Who knows? Texas Red, you know, who knows what the hell he would have done with him. 
But at that time, in WCW, in that time in Mark's career, I can't imagine things going very, very well. So let's even say that he had stayed there, but eventually maybe WWF wasn't interested in him. And maybe ECW gave him a call or gave him an opportunity. And you start thinking about, hey, maybe if he had been in WCW until 93 or 94, had a working relationship with Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman was familiar with him. Paul Heyman was a, was a fan of the talent and the man. Like it might stand to reason potentially that he would have potentially brought in The Undertaker, or if he would have in this case brought in Mark Calloway, and tried to do something with him. I'd be interested to think about if you bring in Mark Calloway into ECW around that 1994-95 time frame, what Paul Heyman might have done with him, what he would have had in store for him. Because when you look at a company like ECW that featured a number of guys that were perceived to be on the smaller side of things, now all of a sudden you bring in this kind of imposing, monstrous-looking dude. Like Now you're talking about Heyman in the peak of his creative powers as a wrestling mind. Like That would be interesting. It certainly wouldn't have made Taker a massive star, but he would have looked at Mark and seen kind of this outdoorsy guy, this kind of patriotic guy, and he probably would have gotten some lamer version of the, I don't know if there is such a thing as a lamer version of the American badass or big evil taker, but I would anticipate you would have seen something in ECW that would have more closely resembled what you got during a lot of the Attitude Era with Taker, which would have been more of that American badass, big evil, evil type of persona. He would have been some type of biker or some type of something. And he would have gotten over at least to some degree, probably especially would have worked as a heel in that company at that time. And eventually WWF would try to poach him away, put him with the Harris brothers or something, and then they would have jobbed him out pretty quickly and he'd been out the door. That could have happened too. The other thing I think of is, let's say he doesn't come to WWF in 1990 and he sticks around maybe another year or two in WCW. But then he does ultimately make the jump to WWF. They're able to convince Vince that this is a guy that you want to deal with. You know, I sit there and I think about what happens if he comes in 1993 or 1994? Is he saddled with one of those really lame-ass kind of Duke the Dumpster type of gimmicks? Could, and, and this is really fascinating to think of, if he came in 92, 93, could Mark Calloway have ended up being Isaac Yankum instead of Glenn Jacobs? Like, think about that. How crazy would that have been, huh? Instead of Kane <laughs> being the one that ends up being Isaac Yankum, Undertaker could have potentially been Isaac Yankum. Like, who the hell knows? I would say at that particular moment in time, though, like, maybe he would have gotten lucky if the timing was right. Maybe you could have brought him in and he would have been in the diesel type of role instead of Kevin Nash, and he would have been the one that was Shawn Michaels' bodyguard, and he's the one that eventually would have broken off and gotten his own big singles push, world title run of all of that. Certainly would have been possible. Certainly could have been possible. Especially when you look at that kind of era of WWF, that you know kind of new generation, where the company as a whole was getting smarter because they're testing. You got the federal government's looking at them with the steroid trial and everything. You know, the thing you can't take away from Taker, similar to the approach with Kevin Nash, was roids or not, you're 6'10, you're 6'9, you're 6'8, and you're close to 300 pounds. Even without steroids, you're still going to be 6'8", 6'9", 6'10", and close to 300 pounds. Like, you're a big-ass dude, and you're really, really, truly going to stand out. Make no mistake about it. That's why Kevin Nash got the long-ass title reign that he did back in the mid-'90s as Diesel. Because no matter what, he was just naturally a big guy. Like, he looked like a heavyweight at a time where the company was trending smaller in terms of its top talent. And even the guys that you were known for having the physiques, their physiques weren't quite the same. Gee, I wonder why. They weren't finding their physiques at the end of a needle anymore. Well, it could have been a similar type of situation with Taker. Like, I wonder what you guys think. Like, if Taker, if Mark Calloway came to WWF in 1993, I think it's only one of two paths that he would have went down. He would have went down the diesel type of path. Hell, it might have been diesel, you know, for all you know. He could have been Shawn Michaels' bodyguard. He could have been the guy that they end up seeing big things in and ended up pushing him big down the road, and he got a long run as a champ. Or he goes down the path of the Isaac Yankums of the world, the spark plug Bob Hollies of the world, the Duke the Dumpster Drazies of the world. Like, what would he have been? 
You know, I have a feeling like Vince would have looked at him like he looked at Bill Irwin and said, you know what? I see a hockey player. He's the goon. He would take one look at Mark Calloway and be like, so you're a basketball player, huh? We're going to call you the rebounder. The rebounder. The rebounder. I'm going to say it enough and eventually it's going to get over with you, but you know what? As stupid as it sounds and as terrible as it sounds, it sounds exactly like the type of crap that Vince would have done back in mid-90s WWF. Ooh. Ooh. Could you imagine? They'd had, they'd had Undertaker come out in freaking basketball shorts and a headband and tube socks and <laughs> all the shit. Now I might actually kind of talk myself into wanting to see that at least one time. Um, which one would it be? Would he have gotten the big push? Or would he have went down the other path of getting saddled with a loser type of gimmick that absolutely had no chance? And maybe if he would have been saddled with that type of gimmick, would he still found a way to make it work? As you know, when you look at the character of The Undertaker, you have a lot of reasons to sit there and say, that, that shouldn't have worked. There's no reason that worked. That should have been f fucking dismissed quickly. And sometimes it's all about timing. And you think about The Undertaker. Like, to me, it's a perfect example of, you know, sometimes things happen for a reason. Early part of his career... Didn't go all that well. He made the leap when he did, and the stars kind of aligned. Might not have been the way he envisioned. I can't imagine Mark Calloway sitting there thinking to himself, you know, the way that I'm going to get really over in professional wrestling and become a huge star is to portray a dead man. And that's exactly what he did. This is fascinating, again, as I think about it, like who he was, what he could have been, you know, what would have happened if... Timing a bit different. Like sometimes you get one shot, one opportunity. That's right. One shot, one opportunity. And you got to make the most of it. And that's what he absolutely did. But it doesn't change the fact that it can be a lot of fun to ponder what could have been. What if The Undertaker did not come to WWF in 1990? What do you guys think would have happened to him? Where do you think he would have went next in his career? Would we even really talk about him to this day? Would we even know about him to this day? Or would he have just been another name from the past that everybody quickly forgets? I wonder what you guys think. Because to me, it's a fascinating question to ask. So anyways, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you smash that subscribe button. And also, check out all the videos from the 30 Days of Undertaker video series. I'm doing a video a day in the month of November to commemorate Mark Calloway, The Undertaker's 30 years in WWE, we're six days through, let's keep it rolling.